Hey everybody on Facebook, welcome back to Gettysburg 158. You're with the American Battlefield Trust. I'm Gary Edelman at the American Battlefield Trust. We got the trust Chris White behind the camera over there and we've got more guests and more to talk about on the first day at Gettysburg. Now, to be clear, we've done the first day uh, the last four years during the anniversary. So if you wanna complete your story, go there, go to battlefields.org and check out some of what we have to offer so you can understand the first day a little bit better. Also, this morning over near the railroad cut, we are on Facebook. Um, showing uh, you know what happened in some of the initial phases of the battle we kind of covered a middle phase um, over on Oak Hill which might be visible behind me over here and now we're in a lower plane we had been talking about the Union first corps fighting you know a couple of confederate divisions but now we're gonna have some new troops entering the field and when you talk about this plane you're namely talking about one particular corps one that is often disparaged we'll see how our historians handle this today so let's bring on tim smith adams county historical society licensed battlefield guide to set it up of course the 11th army corps, army corps we're largely talking about general oliver otis howard a lot of times the 11th Army Corps is referred to as the German Corps. About half of the units are made up of immigrants to the United States, and a large portion of them, of course, are Germans. As a matter of fact, we're standing next to the 74th Pennsylvania Memorial, and this unit had elements in it from Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, and some Germans from Baltimore. So they were largely German immigrants, as opposed to like the 153rd Pennsylvania that was part of the 11th Army Corps that was Pennsylvania German or Pennsylvania Dutch, which means that even though they were German, their families had been in the United States for many generations. So General Oliver Otis Howard, uh, uh, of course, he was at Emmitsburg, Mar Emmitsburg, Maryland in the morning of July 1st. And I think sometimes when we read about the battle we know what happens so we tend to view things from that perspective but general howard's orders for july 1st were just to bring his men up the emmitsburg road and sort of just uh stop his men just south of gettysburg right while reynolds came forward uh general john fulton reynolds being the in charge of the wing at that time with the 11th corps under his umbrella and await orders well Howard started his men on the Emmitsburg Road and he rode to town. And as Troy mentioned earlier, he rode into the town. He managed to find an observatory on top of the Fonestock building. And while he was there, he learned that General Reynolds had been killed in the fighting and he was in command. And Howard's only knowledge of what the general plan for July 1st was, was his discussions with General John Fulton Reynolds the night before and messages he had received from his staff officers that morning. So uh, Howard, uh, uh, just like Abner Doubleday, assumed that Reynolds wanted to hold the area north and west of the town. At some point, Howard decided to bring his 11th Army Corps through the town and occupy this area in the plain north of Gettysburg. Uh, according to Abner Doubleday, uh, he, he had hoped that uh, Howard would sort of uh, form an angle with the 1st Army Corps back across the edge of the town, probably back near where the Gettysburg College campus is towards the Harrisburg Road. They had information from Union Cavalry Scouts that the Confederate Army were north and a little northeast of the town. So they knew that they were coming in that direction and they should make dispositions to meet an enemy attack in that direction. Now, we get this idea that Howard, uh, with two of his divisions uh, under Carl Schurz, who technically could be now in charge of the 11th Army Corps because, of course, Howard is in command of the Army, and uh, Barlow's division actually comes out here uh, to the edge of the town, and uh, he's hoping at first that they can occupy that hill, as Troy mentioned, Troy Harmon, in an earlier video, but the Southern Army had already occupied that hill. It seems more likely, as Carl Schurz writes in his post-war reminiscence, that the better position would have been across these plains here again, uh, consolidating the force near the edge of the town. And we can look back here and see some of the buildings along what we call Broadway. And none of these buildings were here at the time of the battle. The town was a little farther back. But that little rise of ground over there uh, may be putting the right flank on the Emmitsburg Road. So uh, Schurz Division, uh, actually moves out into this area and forms a strong skirmish line against the Confederates that are occupying Oak 
hill at that time and of course we just talked about they're skirmishing along, along the side of oak ridge you get a totally different perspective of that skirmish between o'neill and iverson and elements of the first corps from this location now one thing that you know is, is when you get into this and study this part of the battle one thing you have to realize is that general howard and general reynolds have totally different styles of command General Reynolds, of course, commands from the front. And um, of course, on the first day's battlefield, he leads a charge and he's killed in the fighting. When Howard arrives, Howard thinks it's best to command the troops out here by staying back on the other side of town on Cemetery Hill. And let me just suggest that I believe the proper style of command is somewhere between the two. The problem is that Howard is not in a position to understand what is going on. We know that when uh, Schur's division arrives out here first, and then Barlow arrives. And Francis Channing Barlow and Howard, we have uh, a few good accounts of, ride together to the edge of the town. And theoretically, during that time that they rode out here together, they discussed the situation. They must have discussed where Howard would like to place Barlow. They must have discussed the fact that he has intelligence that the Southern Army is coming in on the Harrisburg Road and north and east of the town. Um, but neither one really talks about what they discussed after the war, so we're kind of left in this void. And uh, after Howard talks to Barlow, as the troops are marching in from the, uh, you know, from the town out here into the fields north of town, he rides over to Schurz. And again, Schurz believes that Barlow's division will just form uh, next to him and sort of on an angle back towards the Harrisburg Road where he can best defend against the Confederate advance. But we know the story. Um, if you're not, you know, we're not going to get into too, too great detail. Barlow decides to move his men forward to an exposed position on a knoll out about a mile in this direction. And most of his troops are facing against the Confederate position on Oak Hill and just seems to almost totally ignore the fact that there's a road off to his right flank that the Southerners are advancing on. So he either doesn't realize uh, that the reports, you know, that he, they must have been talking about that the Southerners are coming in that way or, or um, he just doesn't think it's that critical or he believes that uh, battery of artillery he's placed out there initially and some skirmishers he threw rock, across Rock Creek are going to give timely notice of that advance. But Barlow, much like Sickles on the second day of the battle, moves his troops to an exposed position and compromises the entire line of the 11th Army Corps. And, you know, maybe he believed that Steinwehr's division, the other division of the 11th Corps, would come through the town and assist him. But we know that Howard has plans to keep Steinwehr's division on the other side of town and place them on Cemetery Hill. And I'm here to tell you that General Howard placing Steinwehr's division on Cemetery Hill is, that is a critical decision made by uh, the Northern Army during the battle. And to me, in my mind, it's not Buford. It's not Reynolds. It's General Oliver Otis Howard, who I am highly critical of most of the time, that chose the position upon which the Northern Army would fall back to, a position from which the Northern Army would deliver the victory at Gettysburg. Man, thanks, Tim. And, you know, he was just starting to get worked up there, and I was just hoping it was going to continue. He was really going to get angry or something, but it didn't quite happen. You're with the American Battlefield Trust. This is Gettysburg 158. We're here. The rain has stopped, at least for now, and it's a beautiful day as we talk about July 1st, 1863. Happy to see our friends Amber, Joe, Jim, um, and Dave Weggie. I'll give you a last name thing, even. And what I want to say is that, you know, for anybody who's just on Facebook and not on our YouTube channel, subscribe to that channel. The video we just showed shot on Oak Hill. We had artifacts that were there during the battle and some brought here for the first time since the battle. So we really hope that you'll go and check those out now. Tim sort of set up the 11th Corps and brought them out to this field here. But here we got uh, uh, Doug Dowd's U.S. Army War College and a good friend of the trust to take us a little bit further. All right, gang. So now that we brought the 11th Corps out here, let's bring our fight and we'll talk about where we left off and when it was up on Oak Hill. 
When we said that O'Neill's brigade starts to come forward, they get repulsed in part by some men from the 11th Corps as well. We know the 45th New York is out here. We know Dilger, Hubert Dilger's uh, artillery battery is out here. In fact, the men from the 45th New York are going to rush forward, and you can see the red barn just over my shoulder. When they capture some Alabamans in that barn, in fact, the Schwartz brothers will meet for the first time since they immigrate to the United States. One brother stayed in the north, one went down to Alabama, and when they're in that barn, they see each other for the first time. We talk about the Civil War as a war of brothers. The Schwartz brothers meet in that barn. The younger brother will be sent off as a prisoner. When this Confederate attack catches up, he'll be freed. He'll learn that his older brother, Corporal Rudolph Schwartz, has been killed by a shell. For all these units that are out here, we can see that they're facing Oak Hill, and this makes sense. That's where the threat is. Moreover, when the Confederates, although they're coming down that ridgeline, they do kick a brigade of Georgians out here, Dole's Georgia Brigade, and Dole's does a wonderful job of fighting this flank out, protecting the flank of those Confederates that are up on that ridgeline. That's why most of these Union soldiers are oriented this way. Now, what we can do is step forward, because not only late in the or middle of the afternoon is there an attack that comes from Oak Hill, ridge but if we look back over we can see a large radio tower tim talked about the old harrisburg road right at the base of that radio tower is the old harrisburg road there's 6500 soldiers in jubal early's division coming down that road and what they're going to do is with francis barlow's division sitting out there in that exposed position most of them oriented this way they'll have some skirmishers out across rock creek and all of a sudden they get slammed into by georgians under john brown gordon of antietam sunken road fame where he gets wounded five times in fact they're going to splash across rock creek slam into the end of the union line and there will be additional brigades from north carolina and louisiana that will outflank that position and then what we're going to find is always 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 out on this field on july 1st the Union line will break down from right to left. For all these Union soldiers trying to fight Confederates in front of them, they'll now have Georgians, North Carolinians, and, Al uh, and Louisianans rolling in behind them, and that will send them retreating back across this field. That attack is supported by 14 pieces of artillery under Hillary Jones Artillery Battalion and one of the least visited avenues on all this park. In fact, they'll be dueling with four cannons from 19-year-old Lieutenant Bear Wilkerson's artillery battery. In the midst of this, a shell will come down, hit Wilkerson in the leg. He'll put a, he'll put a, a, a tourniquet on his leg to keep himself from bleeding to death. He'll be carried back to the almshouse, put in the basement with one of his troopers. In fact, he'll take off his canteen and hand to one of his troopers, take out his penknife, and he'll amputate his own leg. Now, even in the right of that, when the right of the line starts to collapse, one of the last moves they're going to do is try and send over the 17th Connecticut on this day, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Douglas Fowler, riding a beautiful white horse. He's the last effort to keep this line from collapsing. In fact, those 14 Confederate cannon that are shooting there, Fowler will turn in his saddle and say, dodge the big ones, boys. And right about then, a shell will come down, hit him in his head. His head explodes across the front rank of his men as two other Union regiments retreat back to the line. And this this is what spells the end of the 11th Corps. Always, always, always they will collapse across this field. Some of it is a pell-mell retreat, others much more controlled as they fall back across. And as we spin around and we look at how this all falls apart now, these Union troops start to retire back through town. But if we look at the Union line up on the extension of Seminary Ridge up there, what we call Baxter's Tower. They now realize, although they're fighting Confederates coming in from the West, there's Confederates from behind them, and that won't last. This will lead to decisions like uh, the division commander, John Robinson, to order the 16th Maine out there to hold at all hazards, to buy time for him to get the rest of his brigade off of this line. This is the collapse of the northern end of the Union line on July 1st. Gary. That's great stuff, Doug. Thanks so much. Let's walk a little bit. There's a tour over there, so we don't want to get too close. And I actually see who the tour is being led by. It's led by another licensed battlefield guy named Stuart Dempsey, who makes his real cottage industry out of the 11th Corps here. And I had a something about Mary moment on either the Battle of Gettysburg podcast or addressing Gettysburg, another podcast, or even on both when he was a guest and talking about some of these, you know, Germans that are in, you know, impressions that are in this army. Because, you know, we can pronounce Schimmelfennig well enough, but when it comes to another one, a guy maybe we call Kritz or Krasnowski or Shizanowski or, th or everything like that. You know, somebody asked him, you know, he said, well, I figured out how to say because I went to Poland. They're like, you've been to Poland? He's like, well, on my first few trips, I went to Poland. And it's like something about Mary when the guy's like, you've been to Santiago, Chile twice in one year. Um, so nonetheless, it's apparently Shizanowski. 
That's what at least people in the same area where he was from said at the time. And his first name is, I guess, Vladimir, but they probably pronounce that in a different way as well. Um, it's good to see so many of you engaging with us here on the first day. Um, and we're going to bring back Tim Smith on here because Doug took the retreat in. I guess there's nothing else to say, Tim. I highly doubt that. <laughs> there's always something else to say or another point to be made. But, you know, um, one thing is interesting about the... Uh, uh, retreat of the 11th Army Corps is it is true that the Southern Army hit the area around what we refer to as Barlow's Knoll and at that part of the line collapses but at the same time that line, part of the line is collapsing of course the Union Iron Brigade is being driven out of the Herbst Woodlot and back to the seminary the Union uh, 11th Army Corps attempts to make a stand around the Alms House and in these open fields north of the college. About the same time, the seminary is being attacked and both the Union 11th Army Corps and the 1st Army Corps collapse. And I find it interesting that when you read literature about the battle, especially literature written in the 1880s and 1890s, obviously, there's many more regimental histories written by the units of the 1st Army Corps than the 11th Army Corps. And perhaps, uh, you know, uh, being uh, the German Corps and a lot of men involved in these units that, um, uh, you know, were not uh, from the United States, there's a certain amount of prejudice against the immigrants that are in these units. And in almost all the histories of the regiments of the 1st Army Corps, they make it sound as if they were holding their own and they were fine until the cowardly 11th Army Corps were driven back through the fields north of the town and then they were forced to retreat. But in point of fact, the retreat on July 1st was um, kind of a separate retreat. The seminary broke through, the Union 1st Army Corps retreat, the line here collapses, the 11th Army Corps retreat. Try to imagine the situation. Now, just as an overview, some 20,000 Northern soldiers retreated through the town, followed by some 30,000 Southern soldiers. 2,000 people are in the town hiding in their cellars, and all the roads lead to one spot in the center of the town. It was chaos. And during the first day of the battle, thousands of Northern troops were captured. Now, of course, the Union hospitals are overrun by the Southern Army when they captured the town. And, you know, we argue about this and that, but I maintain it's one of the worst disasters in the United States Army history. Uh, you find very few days when more soldiers were captured. I mean, we have um, like maybe Corregidor, but a lot of those are uh, Filipino soldiers. Uh, Harper's Ferry, when Stonewall Jackson surrounds Harper's Ferry, and maybe in the fighting at Shiloh. Um, but there are very few times when the, or, when the Southern Army was, or an army against the United States Army, was so successful and captured so many men. And just an ex example, uh, one of the histories written uh, by the soldiers up here is by a guy in 26, 26 Wisconsin. And off the top of my head, and I'm gonna butcher his last name as Gary was just talking about it. I think his name is like Doomcheck. And uh, his, his book, which the first few pages are about the fighting here in the fields north of town, is called 20 Months in Confederate Prison. Wow. Thanks, Tim. This is great stuff. First of all, my apologies for ending up in the shot. I know you're not hoping to see me, you know, sort of, you know, looking at my phone in the background. Uh, my apologies. You're with the American Battlefield Trust. I'm Gary Edelman. Chris White behind the camera. We have a bunch of guests with us. And I think I have my first, my favorite two comments um, of the live series so far. One, uh, Joe uh, commented that, hey, I'm standing right near you with a third division marker. And then I looked up and there he was waving to me. And then another one, uh, Glenn Shrizwicki said, good pronunciation of Shizanowski, take it from me. Now, I probably just messed up both of those, and that's my apology for that. Uh, let's move a few more steps over here. We don't want to disrupt the tour, but I'd like to bring on our friend, Ann Mitchell. We didn't see her on the last video um, that was on YouTube on Oak Hill, but um, Ann is from Ancestry and Fold3, of course. She's the family historian, and um, Ann, I think you're gonna have a question. So, Doug, Tim, get ready. All right, I want to think about this on a more personal level. We've heard these great stories about what was happening here. And as you look at the fields here, I mean, it's beautiful. 
It is everywhere you look. It's scenic everywhere. But on those three days, it was not scenic. There were dead bodies everywhere. There were wounded men everywhere. It was horrible. So what I want to do is talk to Doug, Tim, about what was it like? What, what happened to those men after those three days? We know from a previous video, video that Gladhill, he deserted. He dropped his sword or his uh, gun. How many men actually deserted? How many men stayed? And what happens? What happens to somebody after three days of this? What was in the troops' minds? Tim, Doug? Well, you know, uh, first of all, I think that uh, you have to understand that today, you know, we have a knowledge of war based on, um, you know, watching TV or seeing photographs of war. And what did the general public know about what it was like to be in battle at that time? We're often reminded that the people that fought in the Civil War, you know, grew up looking at woodcuts of heroic charges across the open field in the Revolution or the Mexican War. And if you did die, you died gloriously and you threw your hands up and everybody saw you die and you were a martyr. And then of course, you fight in a civil war um, and bloated bodies are lying out in the hot July sun for weeks afterwards and you're buried in an unknown grave. And the, the, the shock of what it must have been like is just something that, you know, uh, we have trouble wrapping our heads around. And, um, you know, and it's so easy at the time for people to be uh, classified as cowards. And you can imagine, like in a red badge of courage, why someone might run during, uh, you know, uh, 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 battles such as the urge to live. But, I get asked the question about deserters alive, especially like in Pickett's Charge, or, you know, why didn't they just desert? Well, you know, and I always, I always tend to answer people that, you know, at the Battle of Gettysburg, the men that fought in both of these armies had been through a lot prior to this. Gettysburg were two years into the war, and if you were going to desert, you probably would have deserted after the first battle, or the second battle, or the third battle, or the fourth battle, or the fifth battle. So we have the guys that are here, that are in the army, and they're fighting, uh, maybe not just for what they believe in, but maybe they're there because, remember, the units are all from the same towns. There are brothers and uncles and cousins in the same units, fathers and sons. First of all, you want to stay to help your brother, your father, your son. And, you know, secondly, if you do desert, where are you going to go? Exactly. You're going to go to California? You, and you can't some of go, them did. You can't some go back did. home. Yeah, it becomes an interesting point to pick up on Tim's theme about, hey, we're all been recruited from the same small town. It also explains how you get people to do some of the things we're going to ask them to do, whether it's on July 3rd, Pickett's Charge, attacking across that field. Once one of us decides to go, we all have to go. Because if you don't, you can never go back home either. So it's part of how we recruit this way, but also, as Tim said, all the narrow-shouldered leadership and, and thin-skinned folks are gone. These are all hardy veterans for the most part. They've seen what it takes. Moreover, you know, just on a, on a slightly interesting point, you know, think about it, it's payday on the 30th of June. This is why it's great to study the Battle of Gettysburg. Everybody shows up to get paid, right? So then we fight on the 1st, which means the rosters are pretty tight. Now, truth be told, we do know people do desert after. We talk about the 4th uh, of July meeting that Meade has uh, with his council of war. And as they, they kind of quickly do back of the envelope map, they think they have about 56,000 soldiers. We go, yeah, well, the Union Army didn't lose 40,000 cows. That means almost 15 to 20,000 men have been shaken loose from their units. Guys that have, you know, been hit by heat stroke on the way up here or just fallen out of the march or stragglers. Um, and then we also know right after, for instance, some people do desert. Right? Maybe after three days of seeing this, the bucket is full. PTSD is not new. At some point, the human condition can only take so much. Or we see other people start to desert maybe in, in August or the fall, and, it, and, and you go, well, it's harvest season. Maybe things aren't going so well back on the farm. But this idea of deserters, uh, I think, becomes a really difficult question. And I think it becomes, at least uh, on the Union side, I would think it's less and less. And maybe it becomes more and more on the Confederate side, certainly as we get towards the end of the war. We know, you know, 500 to 700 men are leaving Lee's army as Sherman is marching across Georgia. And they're thinking about who's taking care of us. How does this all end? So what happens, let's say, somebody deserts on the Union side. Let's start there. What do they do? 
who go, do they go after them? Do they, if they catch them, then what happens to them? Is, or what are the penalties for doing something like that? Well, you know, in a general sense, uh, you're put on a list as a deserter, and that list is published and it's circulated, and then each area in the north and the south is divided into a district, and each district has a provost uh, marshal and uh, that you know and there's some kind of force that can you know arrest these people if they if they catch them and you know theoretically return them to service so it's 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 very drastic i think we hear uh you know if there's multiple desertions and there's a serious problem they might make an example out of somebody and execute them but uh most of the time when i read about it they just catch them you're you're punished and you're uh, returned to service now if you are returned to service you might be put on frontline duty when you were not on frontline duty before right so um uh, but you know it, to me it's it you know they're just trying to uh make it so this does they're trying to keep this from happening as much as they can of course the whole movie uh, cold mountain i guess is based on uh, one of these stories in the south where there's you know squads of men that are sent in to gather up deserters and bring them back into the army so um, in my experience in Pennsylvania, my reading, uh, we don't have that, that so much, but probably somewhere else we do. Yeah, and even some of the army policy is, think about when George, uh, when Joe Hooker takes over the Army of the Potomac, there's so many go men gone from the army, they actually issue an amnesty. So that guys who had been gone that weren't on furlough or leave or holiday or whatever they were taking at the time, that they could come back and join their unit without any penalty at all to try and increase. Because ultimately what we want is men to stand in the ranks. You signed up for three years or the duration, and that's what we wanted to hold you to. So I, one question. So do you think it's the fact that people were, I mean, these units were communities. I know like Company D, North Carolina 55th, I'm related. 80% of them. No joke. And just real quick, Ted said he's all into the 55th North Carolina, Alexander Car County, North Carolina. All right. We will talk about him later. But uh, so is that one of the things that just holds people together? This is a war of community. It's also, I mean, as we talk about these different things and I just hear about you guys talking about units that get wiped out, that's a whole community that is devastated and that's a whole different thing that's happening. So it's the sense of community, it seems to me, that drives a lot of these men to do what they do every day on the field. Sure. And, you know, I, I can't speak to how this much has happened in the South, but here's an example of Gettysburg. Two examples I know of. Uh, we just talked to Dave Malgin. He had a, um, a repeating rifle. No, I'm sorry. He had a sharps rifle, right, from um, a guy in the 17th Pennsylvania Cavalry, Company G. Well, they were from Rouserville. And on June 29th, General Buford's command came through Rouserville, and on the night of June 29th, the company commander just turned his back, and all the men in that company went home that night that to their families. Sense. And according to the regimental history, early the next morning, they all returned for duty. You know, and then we have Company K, 1st Pennsylvania Reserves, from Gettysburg. And they are in the wheat field on July 2nd. And on the evening of July 3rd, after the battle's over, the company commander turns his back and well, he's one of them. They all leave and they go and visit their families. And according to the regimental accounts, the next morning they all return for duty. You know, I bet we could go through and find little baby booms that happen nine months later after all those events. <laughs> That's great. So I'm going to jump back in here because we don't want this one to go too long. But I do want to say we have in Denise, another family historian, a genealogist. Uh, and so you'll like that. I'm sure you already use Ancestry in Fold 3, and I'm glad we're partnering with them today. And we had one guy named Jamie who, in this voice, put this comment in there. Get Chris in front of the camera. And I think Chris probably knows who I mean, and he wants you to. And then there was some sort of a threat of violence. I'll just say this, you know, if Chris and I went, I'd give him the advantage. But if the fight lasts long enough, you know, I have a lot of energy. I'll I just fight say dirty. That. <laughs> Chris does. So if Chris is willing to come in front of the camera to set up our final thing, we'll see. He has to hand the camera off if he's willing. That's a no from Chris. Oh, my God. Okay, he's willing. And he's going to set up a battery here. All right. Thanks, Gary. Uh, what we're going to talk about out here actually kind of piggybacks off of what Ann is going to talk about. We're going to go from heroism 
to treason, and that would be Hubert Dilger. Hubert Dilger is in command of Battery I, 1st Ohio Light Artillery, and he'll fight his guns here at Gettysburg as well as Chancellorsville. And he has a nickname Old Leather Breeches, and uh, he's going to wear buckskin pants out onto the battlefield. But he is one of our German immigrants, and remember, at this time, we don't know Germany as we know it, uh, knew it as today. At one point, there's 300 small principalities, and you know it's very broken up, and we'll eventually have that German reunification uh, in the 1870s, but we're not quite there yet. So we have these men coming over here from various principalities, and, and one of these former soldiers is Hubert Dilger. Dilger, uh, Dilger is a very good gunner. Uh, when the 11th Corps receives a new chief of artillery, a guy named Thomas Osborne, he transfers in from the 3rd Corps. He is just disgusted by having to come to the 3rd Corps, or I'm sorry, the 11th Corps, as are many of the officers transferred in the 11th Corps in the wake of Chancellorsville. But once he gets here, he starts to realize that the problem wasn't at the bottom. The problem was at the top. The problem was with the leadership. As our former president of the American Battlefield Trust says, the fish stinks from the head. And that was some of the problems that we're dealing with out here. But Dilger at, at Chancellorsville will fight his guns holding back Stonewall Jackson's men. And when he comes out here onto the battlefield at Gettysburg, he's actually going to cross this plane behind us with another battery. Ten full guns will come out here, six Napoleons, and the rest will be rifle cannons under William Wheeler and his 13th New York uh, artillery. They'll come up to a place called Stevens Run, which is at the back end of Gettysburg, and they're going to find out they can't get over stop of Stevens Run. So they'll take down a fence and, and put their uh, guns into battery, fire, let their men put down the fence inside of that, that stream, then they will cross one battery at a time, uh, protecting one another, leapfrogging forward. If you're familiar with infantry skirmishers, this is exactly how they advance in the field. You have a loaded gun to the front, one man fires, advances, fires, advances. That's what these artillery pieces will do. Dilger's guns will move to a point about 300 yards behind me. Don't believe the monument. Go read the monument. It'll say 300 yards north of this position is where I, I was positioned. Dilger's guns will come into battery and they will start aiming towards Carter's battalion, which is setting up on Oak Hill that uh, Doug talked about a little bit earlier. And the guns are doing very good effect down here on Dilger, but Dilger becomes aggravated at one point, walks up to a gun, fires at Carter's battalion, and hits one allegedly right on the muzzle. And he, it, when they asked Captain how did the shot go, he said, I plugged it at the muzzle. And allegedly later, when Union soldiers go up on top of Oak Hill after the battle, they found a Napoleon can and Napoleon dented uh, right at the barrel. So he may have actually hit that cannon. Now, Dilger himself, for his actions during the war, will be, will be a recipient of the Medal of Honor. Fast forward to 1917. His son uh, is going to be uh, uh, born in the late 18th, uh, 19th century, and then his son, who has German ties, decides that he wants to throw in with the Kaiser during World War I. His father's a Medal of Honor recipient. The son decides that he wants to conduct biological warfare against the United States and infect head of cattle with anthrax and then feed that meat to the American people or troops. Uh, he's found out, flees, and is never going to be tried for treason even though he is, uh, is up for treason, uh, but he will die of the Spanish flu pandemic. Uh, in 1918. And another useless fact for you when coming back to the Spanish flu epidemic, there is a, a camp here in 1918 known as Camp Colt run by a, a, a young officer named Dwight Eisenhower. Uh, Eisenhower is going to be very effective in taking care of the flu epidemic here in Gettysburg. But unfortunately, the army does bring the flu to Adams County, and that flu will kill more civilians during World War I than any civilians dying here during the Battle of Gettysburg. So World War I claims more lives here in Gettysburg due to the army than the fighting here over three days in July of 1863. Wow. Awesome. So you can't now. So because we have ancestry here, let's pick up. So Chris just got done talking about his son. Let's talk about Hubert Dilger's grandsons, of which he has three. Two of them go on to fight for the Wehrmacht. One goes on to serve with the United States Navy. Not my favorite Hubert Dilger story, though. Eventually, he ends out in the Western Theater. As he's driving with Sherman's army in Atlanta, they will be just outside of Marietta. In fact, they'd be watching an opening and a clearing. And occasionally, some Confederate generals would walk out in that clearing, and these artillerists, 
Dilger's battery to be included, are argued to go ahead and target that position. The general Confederate general officers walk out there, they go, heads up, the Union artillery is active. And sure enough, as they stand there, a shell will fly over their heads. Uh, Leonidas Polk was not a, uh, a nimble individual, uh, so he was a little slower moving away. The next round fired from Hubert Dilger will actually tear through Leonidas Polk's left arm, go through his chest, hit him in the right arm, and then explode a tree right against him, almost cutting him in half. Hubert Dillinger is truly a technical expert when it comes to the employment of artillery. So for all the things we just talked about now, this is the story of the first day of the Battle of Gettysburg. It's Union soldiers from the north and from the west of town that give and get driven back through these fields north of town and back through the fields west of town, through the town of Gettysburg to the high ground south of town. And the Confederates will spend the next two days trying to drive them from that high ground. That's great. Thanks so much, Doug. And just to address some of the questions about when we're going to go live next, we don't know how long, you know, a live is going to go. We don't know if we'll have connectivity. Wait till you see our next spot if we're able to go live. You'll understand some of the things we're dealing with. But suffice to say that we're going to be climbing up a ladder one at a time to get to our place if it works. So um, I really appreciate everything. I want to thank Jamie Wright for suggesting to get Chris out here because look at all that stuff in his head. We just need to give him the opportunity and off he goes. So thanks to Chris. Thanks to Doug Douts. Thanks to Tim Smith and to Ann. Uh, uh, from Ancestry Fold 3. Uh, this has been a lot of fun. We will go uh, live again before long and make sure in the meantime, um, you know, we'll probably do this in a couple of hours, by the way. Um, so we're going to have some lunch. We do eat. And despite somebody telling me I need a donut, I do eat. Um, and we need to, uh, you can go back and look at any of the videos from this morning you may have missed or the Gettysburg campaign on the way up here. So thank you for watching. Thanks for all your comments. I'd like to see more hashtags and thank you for supporting Battlefield Preservation.